This I will remember And the sadness in your eyes So now it's goodbye Indian lady In the last decade of the 19th century, the British created present-day Uganda by amalgamating several kingdoms and chiefdoms together. The result was a wonderful country that Winston Churchill later baptized the Pearl of Africa. It stretched from the Elgon mountain ranges of the eastern border with Kenya, with the source of the world's longest river, the Nile, in the central, up to the famous Mountains of the Moon, at its western border with Congo, while sharing the world's largest inland freshwater, Lake Victoria, to the south with Tanzania, while touching the vast Sudan to the north. Without the, uh... the colonialists brought in different foreign communities to assist the process of building the state, beginning with Sudanic mercenaries that helped crush the military resistance to the imposition of colonial rule. Indians were brought in for different purposes as the first police officers to build the capacity of maintaining law and order. Indian police officers were the right choice because India's penacourt was imported almost wholesale to Uganda. Indians were also brought in to help build the railway, a vital infrastructure for developing an export economy. After the completion of the railway, some remained behind to settle and explore new economic opportunities. Others went back home, but more came to Uganda in pursuit of the new African dream in the virgin land at the heart of the continent. For a while. From about a million people at colonization, Uganda grew as a nation and an economy, attaining independence in 1962 with a population of 6 million. The economy thrived, powered to a large extent by Indian entrepreneurs and industrialists whose hub was ginger at the source of the Nile. The Indians played a vital role in the country's development as they carried same processing all over the country, thus adding value to the local farmers' produce. The Indians very significantly did not take over much land and land conflicts that afflicted other colonies were unknown in Uganda. They controlled trade as well and were easily the most wealthy community in the land. But they kept to themselves, their culture, and never sought to convert the locals to their religions. Behind us, the road moves ever on. On August 4, 1972, Uganda's President Idi Amin Dada, who had seized power in a bloody coup the previous year, announced that he had a dream. Amin said in the dream, the Almighty Allah had instructed him to declare a so-called economic war by expelling non-citizen Indians from Uganda because they were exploitative, allegedly milking a cow which they were not feeding. He gave them only 90 days to vacate the country and was not allowing them to take their wealth or valuables. I took this decision for the economy of Uganda. And I must make sure that every Ugandan get a fruit of independence. Since independent, actually Uganda is not yet independent, I will say that, even when the British handed over on the 9th of October 1962, the Uganda still not yet independent. Uganda will be independent after this, my decision, after I want to see that the whole Kampala Street is not full of Indians. It you? must be proper black and uh, administration in those shops is run by the Ugandans. At the time, Uganda had 80,000 people of Asian origin, generally called Indians, locally. This was 1% of Uganda's population of 8 million. 23,000 of them, that is over a quarter, had already obtained Ugandan citizenship. 50,000 were British passport holders, leaving only 7,000 Asians of other nationalities like Pakistan and Bangladesh. The national broadcaster, UBC, started running an hourly countdown of the days left for the non-citizen Indians to leave. 
Then suddenly, President Amin announced that it was not only citizen Indians to leave, but also all Asians had to go. There was a confusion. Apparently, it was logistically impossible to relocate 80,000 people to other countries at such notice. So Amin craftily hashed a plot that resulted into a stampede. A rainbow around your door The wind would always First, he arrested the wealthiest Indian in the country, the industrialist head of the Madivani family empire, and incarcerated him in filthy conditions at Machindia Barracks in Kampala. Then he openly congratulated some German officials on having had such a great leader in Adolf Hitler, saying he had done the right thing to kill six million Jews. Plans to erect a monument for Hitler in Kampala were announced but were not fulfilled by the time Amin lost power in 1979. The international community did not wait for any further warning. Emergency airlifts were arranged to beat the 90-day deadline. The arrest of Munabai Madivan and the praises of Hitler caused the stampede that Amin had wanted to effect his ethnic cleansing. Taking in expelled Indians became an emergency and Britain took in 27,200. Canada took 6,000. India, 4,500. Kenya took in 2,500. Others were taken in by West Germany, Austria, Malawi, Pakistan, Australia, New Zealand, Sweden, Norway, and Mauritius. Those who migrated to Kenya included Sheikha Mehta, who was to become an international motor rolling legend. The nightmare of being forced to leave your country of birth without knowing where you are heading and not being allowed to take your money can only be imagined by someone who has gone through it. Entire families were reported to have committed suicide and in all, 20,000 Indians remained unaccounted for and hopefully most of these 20,000 found their way to other countries of the world on their own. It is likely 99% of the expelled Indians had been born in Uganda by the parents born in Uganda and so had no other place to call home. The expulsion, therefore, could amount to a crime against humanity. The Indians were forced to leave behind some 6,000 companies, homes, small shops and many community facilities, as well as places of worship. On November 4, 1972, the last planes carrying expelled Indians left Entebbe Airport. Other Indians left by road across Uganda's five borders. Some of them had to bribe their way through because the neighbors had closed their borders to prevent the refugee influx. The last Indians to leave Uganda are those who had been thrown in prison and left after the deadline. These were the Madivani family members. Some 16 families never left Uganda adamant and they could not leave their country. We climbed up to the heavens where the mountains call your name in virgin pasture even before the last indians were out of sight the distribution of booty started president idi amin declared the second phase of the so-called economic war and named operation maftamingi which is in kiswahili for very fat or great harvest Operation Maftamingi simply entailed giving the booty to cronies of his regime. It was a frenzy of state-organized robbery. People who had never done any business were lined up and given shops with shelves full of stock, stores full of supplies, cash boxes with cash inside, luxury homes attached to the shops and cars in the garages. Other Indian community facilities like schools were taken over, temples for Hindus and sinks were a dilemma, as nobody knew what to do with them. The other places of worship for mainstream religions like the churches and mosques fitted in the established faiths. Indian child, goodbye, Indian lady, I loved you for a while. Operation Maftamingi was a brief which herald Uganda's economic ruin. The beneficiaries of the Indians' properties parted away as they enjoyed the cash and the cars they got free of charge. They got more cash selling the stock they inherited, then the stock ran out and they had nothing else to sell. They started subletting the shops. Soon, shops of the high street 
Kampala Road started selling pancakes and homemade banana juice poured into empty soda bottles. But the factories were also grinding to a halt. Industrial production went down and eventually died out. The new owners and managers did not even know how to order inputs and spares. Soon, basics like sugar and soap became luxuries, smuggled from neighboring Kenya. It was an era on national humiliation and dehumanization. Uganda was like a haunted country. Even after the fall of Idi Amin in 1979, the immediate subsequent government continued the witch hunt against Indians. The second Milton Obote government, for instance, stripped Uganda's most acclaimed public intellectual, Professor Mahmoud Mamdani, of his Ugandan citizenship. Mamdani is a citizen of Indian ethnicity but has never belonged to any nationality. It's and beyond time, we laughed. In January 1986, the National Resistance Movement, led by Commander Yori Museveni, took power after a five-year guerrilla war. Museveni's administration embarked on the task of restoring order and justice to Uganda. There were several urgent tasks like restoration of human rights and basic governance. But the government also started redressing the past injustices and the Indian question was addressed. Welcoming the Indians and their survivors to reclaim their properties, President Museveni said that they did not need to thank him because it is the duty of a government to deliver justice. Many of the Indians who left Uganda in 1972 settled into their new countries and became prosperous. So returning to a severely damaged Uganda was out of question. Instead, it is in many cases, it was some daring relatives who claimed the properties. Others sold their interests, yet some Indian families who were very committed to Uganda packed their bags and returned. This included the last family to live in the 1972, the Madivanis. At first, many Indians were apprehensive. But two decades since they started returning, Indians are once again powering the country's economy. Old families have been joined by entirely new entrepreneurs coming directly from India. Today, over half of the country's tax revenues paid by Indian businesses. Once again, Indians have resettled in Uganda and as usual, they keep to themselves socially. But this time, President Museveni has advised Ugandans to accept this. The president has asked severally why native Ugandans who love eating meat should expect to marry Indians who are vegetarians and expect to have a happy family moreover while professing different religions. <laughs> <laughs>